Okay, thanks very much, uh, Jim. Yeah, we had a great time, because one of the other things I do, apart from EMC, is Bywater, British Inland Waterways on the Air. And Jim and I operated up at Burton um, from my canal boat one year. Um, the only reason I'm mentioning that is actually that's probably the only place I can go where I can get quiet reception. <laughs> It's really nice to get on the canal boat, get out somewhere in the middle of nowhere and see S0 noise. And the actual water acts as a pretty good antenna as well, or an antenna earth. So, Anyway, I'm here today to tell you a bit about some new things we're trying to do uh, in the RSGB via the EMC committee um, with respect to diagnosing and reporting radio frequency interference. So... What causes RFI? In the home, you've got just about everything you have, your washing machine, your TV, your kitchen equipment. Um, at work, you've got all your computer equipment, everything that's transport, all of the radio stuff, all causes RFI. So in short, just about anything that works on electric will cause some RFI. The only question is, is it harmful or not? So why is it a problem? All electrical devices produce EM radiations. They can either be conducted or they can be radiated. Different ones can be more or less immune to interference. The problems really start to happen when the emission levels of the equipment are high enough to stop the receiver or the equipment that is being interfered with from operating properly. <coughs> so there are two standards in the EMC world. Electromagnetic compatibility is trying to combat RFI by making sure that things can work together. Um, there are emission standards and immunity standards. The emission standards set a limit to what a piece of equipment can give out, either conducted or radiated, and the immunity standards say that that piece of equipment should work in a certain field strength. Unfortunately, it's pretty difficult to set an immunity standard for a state-of-the-art amateur radio or a shortwave listener who's trying to operate as close to the noise as he possibly can. So wait, how does it actually work? Well, on the left, we have the source. The source can either radiate emissions to the victim or it can have conductive emissions. Conductive emissions can either be directly for a piece of wire, like the screen between the two, or it can be via a telephone wire, via an equipment connection, anything like that. And in fact, it can even be inductively or capacitively coupled into the conductor. So you might say, I've just got this bit of wire, it's only connected at one end, it's running across, it's not going anywhere near the source equipment, but it could easily be inductively coupled or capacitively coupled into it. So what does the EMC committee try to do to help with the reduction of RFI? We have two prime arms. We provide advice, we provide support, and using this, we try and help people understand the RFI problems. In recent times, we set up an EMC Matters Forum on the RSGB website, and we have a very large <coughs> amount of information in the form of leaflets helping you self-diagnose also on the website, on the EMC pages. And on top of that, we provide regular updates through the RADCOM columns, through all of the publications. We um, have input into the yearbook, the handbook, and just about everything else. And we have also um, articles that we put up on the website. In fact, this presentation is already up on the website. I put it up last night. So if you go to the EMC publications pages, you can uh, review the presentation at your leisure and uh, maybe give it at your club. The other thing we attempt to do is to protect the spectrum from RFI. Um, we do this by representation on standards committees and a number of people um, 
recently responded to adverts to come and help us in that role. We also spend a lot of time lobbying regulators. Um, I'm certainly not Mr. Ofcom's favourite man any more than Mark is at the back who does the same thing for Aros. Um, we also work where we can with the suppliers and the service providers because it's much better if you can persuade a supplier to do something about something than it is to try and persuade Ofcom to try and persuade the supplier to do something about something. We've been doing a lot of work recently on new technology, new sources of interference. Um, we're suffering a lot of problems from VDSL, the uh, broadband, suffering a lot of problems from some solar PV installations, and a few people are suffering what I can only describe as horrendous problems from wind farms. I don't think Tom is here, but Tom has had an enormous battle on wind farms, and uh, not one. So that's what we do. Um, what's changing? Well, we introduced the EMC Matters Forum and we've had 93,000 visits to that forum since April 2015. And we're very pleased because a lot of you are giving each other advice, which gives us some time to answer the queries that you can't answer. So it's proving very useful. The leaflets and publications, a lot of them have been updated, and we're moving them more towards self-help. So we're trying to provide you with the information to let you gather the correct data, and then we can help you with diagnosis. We run a help desk. Um, Ken Underwood does a great job. Um, we get over 100 reports per annum through that via the email and the telephone. And we've just reintroduced online reporting um, because we need data. Even if we can't help you fix your problem, we need the data to go and bang the suppliers and the regulators around the head with to say, look, you know, we have 93 people reporting serious VS VDSL problems, not the three who you've bothered to look at. We're introducing a new process. It's partly up and partly not up. Um, this is for investigating RFI problems. The aim is that we will give you some signature sheets and you'll see some examples in a bit. Um, these are spectres, waterfalls or recordings made of different types of interference. And then we will provide you with guidance either via leaflets on the web or actually talking to one of our advisors or one of our committee in how to find out. There's three things you need to find out with any type of RFI. You need to find out where it's coming from, you need to find out when it's operating, and in fact when it's operating is often a good clue towards where it's coming from. And you need to find out what it is, and it's the what it is that we're, with the advent of SDRs, like you see here. I mean, I've got the simple sort of setup, any of them you can have. I've got an SDR, I've got the bicycle loop antenna that David put the um, David Lauder put in the column. That's good from 10 to 30 megs. It goes well down towards the noise floor, certainly well below anything we're looking for. And that particular setup, or if it's a conducted emission, um, you can have a simple current clamp, which I thought I had one here. Anyway, I'll find it and get it out. It's just a ferrite with five turns around it. There it is. You can put that around your telephone wire or your mains wire and see if you've got any interference. So there's a couple of simple things you can do that will help you find where it is. The thing that a lot of people say to me is, well, why don't you use DF? The problem is that most of the things that are causing you interference are in the near field and any directional antenna apart from a loop is not very good at nulling near field effects. So, um, in fact, the best way often to find a source is a simple radio like an 817 and you just keep weakening the antenna and then getting a bit closer when you hear the signal again you weaken the antenna and I say to people, don't forget to have a paper clip in your pocket because quite often all you'll need 
to pick up that signal is the antenna disconnected and a paper clip stuck in the, the hole. Don't damage the socket doing it, and certainly not if it's an N-type, but for most of the HF problems in an 817, you can just stick a simple length of wire in there and that'll help you. So that's what we're working towards. Unfortunately, not everybody in the world is trying to work the same way. And Ofcom are under a lot of strain and stress at the moment um, with regards to performance. So they have been reluctant to enforce against non-wireless telegraphy apparatus. What does that mean? That means VDSL, that means wind farms, that means um, solar PV, which are the ones that are causing a lot of trouble. They did fortunately bring in a new statutory instrument this year for Section 54, which allows them to enforce against in-service equipment. And we have been preparing reports and on investigations. So, got there. And the computer locked up. Sorry. So these are a summary of what we've been doing. You can see VDSL. We've had 105 reports. Not many resolved. Plasma TV is a great success. Ken used to be in the TV industry. He's managed to get 26 plasma TV sets replaced by the manufacturer free of charge out of the 30 complaints we've had. Solar PV, the problem is usually the optimizers or the inverters, and if you can get the supplier to follow it through, then most of them can be fixed. And the four that you see up there, are, we, we don't get a lot of feedback with some of these when they're successful, but the four are ones where we know the optimizer was replaced by the supplier and it fixed the problem. And then you've got all the masses of other things, fridges. These digital inverter fridges are becoming much more commonly a problem. Outstanding wind farms are certainly the worst. And breakthrough, we've actually seen a resurgence this year there was a time when we had almost no breakthrough reports. This is where the radio interferes with other equipment. But we've had nine in the last year or so. So that's a bit about what we're doing there. This is a new process. I know you won't be able to follow it all. I know you won't be able to read it all. But it is on the website. And basically, what we want to do is to have the problem recorded on a standard form, get somebody to help you, diagnose where the source is likely to be, find it and record it. If it can be resolved locally, like it's a switch mode power supply for your PC and you change it for one that's okay, great. If not, then what we want to do is to get you to log it and the key words, if we're going to take anything to Ofcom, are harmful interference. If you can't demonstrate harmful interference, um, they won't look at you. The trouble is what you mean by harmful interference and what I mean by harmful interference isn't what's defined in Section 54 and other regulations as harmful interference. You have to be able to prove actual degradation, obstruction or repeated interruption to your radio signal. And unfortunately, if you can still see something they have some argument that you haven't been degraded that much. So what we then have to do is to try and find out a way of lobbying them and the suppliers and get something done. Yes, yes, one of those. Sorry, if I okay. it's what happens when you shorten it on a slide. <laughs> Um, there is an existing leaflet. I'm not going to dwell on this one. Um, it's called EMC04. It tells you very usefully how to get yourself guided through uh, identifying the problem. There's another website that's come up recently, which is brilliant, sigidwiki.com. I don't know if you've looked at that, but that actually puts waterfalls up for many of the common military, civil radio signals. So when you're looking for interference um, and you look at your waterfall uh, you may find it's actually a radar or a military communication channel so that's very good at that it's also got some unknowns and interference on there but that's something we need to develop a lot more so the key to this is what we call comparison with signature sheets 
and these will give you pictures of what to look for. Um, once you've found out it's a solar PV, for instance, you'll probably then start looking at the roofs of your neighbours to find out which one it is. So the guides help you with more information. There are advice, leaflet, advice leaflets once you uh, actually found it to try and see what you can do to minimise the impact. And we ask to record, your, you record the information and send it back to us so we can add it to the database. So you can help others. So that's what we're trying to do. What do we mean by a signature sheet? Something like this. There'll be some words telling you what to look for. There's a spectra at the top and a waterfall at the bottom. This one is classic VDSL. Um, the rise at uh, 5.2 megahertz, sorry I'm only pointing to the middle screen, but the rise on the left there and the drop at, uh, so it's 8.5 and 12, that's upstream too. That's one of the VDSL bands. So that's a typical signature. Different people will have different SDRs. This is on a broadband one. And this is actually looking at the retraining exercise that VDSL goes through every time you transmit and interrupt it. And you can see the carriers, they're four kilohertz apart on the, the top right part of the diagram. And you can see very clearly on the bottom the two steps are upstream one and upstream two. And you see on this one, you've got about, the, the noise floor is raised by about 20 to 30 dB by those. So the carriers uh, give you a clue across all upstream and downstream bands. Um, they're four kilohertz apart. Another common signature, this is a switch mode power supply I bought for my uh, PC so it could operate off the batteries in my car to go and do some measurements. You can probably guess from looking at that how long I used it for. Um, it's good for charging up as I drive from one side to the other, but as soon as I turn it on. And the characteristics of switch mode power supplies are basically harmonics that go on forever. And if I'd kept going, it would have gone much further. And that was actually recorded using what you see here. I thought of trying to do a live demonstration, but I was, wasn't brave enough. Another simple thing is a lead acid battery charger, one of these ones that goes through various cycles to make sure it optimizes your batteries. It done half use a lot of, uh, produce a lot of noise doing it. LED lighting, um, you know, the bottom line there is the limit, and this is an LED floodlight that we've been trying to get shut down and stop from being supplied. Um, you know, it, it stands, this is a conducted emission, but the limit is still 30 dBs above where it should be. Solar PV spectra um, look like that. I haven't got time to go through all of them, but uh, typically it's 40 dB above the background, and it, in this particular case, it was completely wiping out the 10.1 to 10.15 band. The mitigation, um, if the cables are run without the positive and the negative next to each other, they cause a lot more interference. If you star wire them back to the center, and if you've got the right optimizer and the right inverter, then you can actually get the noise down to almost nothing. So there are ways of solving these things. Plasma TV, um, it's a bit like a switch mode power supply, except it's got definite humps in it. Um, they get worse as they get older, um, and we can get them replaced for you. Fluorescent lighting, very distinct, sharp as the, the starter goes. Faulty central heating pump as it changes speed. So the, I don't know if you can just about see the red lines in there, so they move in frequency. Now this is where you can help us. I've only got about 20 signatures. There must be three times that number in the room. If you were all to go home, how many of you have got or can borrow an SDR? Great. How many of you have got something that causes you interference? You know what I'm going to say next, don't you? <laughs> Please make some spectra waterfall recordings like the ones we put up there 
send them in to us, we can add them to the database and it goes along with this self-help. We're not just working in the RSGB on this, we've also got AARU involved through Region 1 and we're getting them to try and find these signatures for us. If you want to confirm what the source is, there's only one test that I can guarantee will confirm the source. It's called the on-off-on test. If it's there when it's on and not when it's off and it comes back when you turn it on again, then you've found it. And you will find, actually, Ken has a, a great saying when he talks about the best way to solve your problems. He reckons the best solution is uh, a bottle of champagne and a box of chocolates and go round to the neighbour who's got the problem and explain to him, you know, that you just want to check whether this is the problem and when you find it is the problem, then would he mind if you tried a different power supply, which you're quite happy to leave with him, because it only cost you 20 quid or 30 quid and it's a lot easier than trying to get Ofcom to help you. Sorry, I didn't say that. Um, so the on-offs, and use the spectrum waterfall displays, but when you do do that, please don't overload the receiver. The number of times we see either aliases because the filtering is bad or um, mixed, mixed, can't think of the word, intermodulation products <laughs> due to overloading the receiver. And be very careful of cheap dongles. They've got almost no filtering in them. So, you know, I've had a number of reports come in where all of the signals that the person was complaining about were out of band aliases because there was no filtering on the dongles. And even the fun cube isn't very good at HF. It's brilliant at VHF. <coughs> but you can get aliases. You can avoid them, but just be careful. Standards, we're working on that. They're international and European standards designed to protect against RFI. The regulations are there. Ofcom have made new regulations, but they're not always willing to enforce them. So what Wireless Telegraphy Act says is they have to provide advice and assistance, and they're very willing to do that. Section 54 allows them to regulate that anything that emits more than a certain amount can't be put into service. Um, and they also have regulations that stop undue interference, of which harmful interference is the relevant part of ours. And this year, they extended the Section 54 regs to apparatus that is, and there are ores between all of these, <laughs> either improperly installed, improperly assembled, improperly maintained, improperly functioning, due to de degradation, deterioration, modification or damage, or it's being used for something other than it was intended they're now able to enforce against that, providing it's apparatus. Apparatus does not cover wires. So they can do something for us. What do they require us to do? They require us to produce evidence of actual harmful interference. If it affects the emergency services, then they're more likely to do something about it. The apparatus responsible has to be identified either by you or by them. And you have to show that you've taken all reasonable steps to minimise the impact on your radio equipment. So if you've got your antenna mounted on the telegraph pole with the, uh, the wire on it and you refuse to move it to the other side of the garden, where the field is probably just as bad, then you might not be deemed to have taken all reasonable steps. This is the killer. This is the one we're arguing with them at the moment. They say, on balance, the public interest must be served. What does that mean? If you have 6 million VDSL customers and 93 complaining am amateurs, the VDSL customers are saying they haven't got enough bandwidth, and the amateurs are saying, you're not notching our bands, who wins? But they do do it in a balanced, transparent, proportional and accountable way. And as a result of our lobbying, they have now visited a number of our sites and we have a meeting later this month, a joint meeting with BT and Ofcom. We've just submitted a 172 page report on all of the interference that we've seen 
um, and we're waiting for their reports, but we are trying, that's all I can say. They say very trying. But <coughs> the evidence you need to collect to demonstrate harmful interference, there are three types of tests. We call it here and there. If you can find interference at your QTH and you can go nearby, similar setup, interference absent, then uh, you can log that and help to prove you've got harmful interference. Now and then, when it's operating, when it's not operating, before it was installed, after it's installed, and with and without, if you can find some way of getting, out, getting rid of it, then uh, you can log that and help to prove that it's causing you harmful interference. You have to demonstrate actual, not potential. So demonstrating the noise floor has raised by 30 dBs doesn't help. And in fact, uh, I often liken it to being in an old days in a castle at the bottom of the walls and somebody says, who's outside there attacking us with bows and arrows? I say, I don't know, because I can't see them. And that's exactly the problem we have these days. You've actually got to find somewhere where the interference is, so you can see what you could receive if the interference wasn't there. So I've told you most of that already. Um, the wind farms is very sad, and you'll see on the next one how bad it is. But we are working actively on those. We are having some useful reports, but we need more evidence. So what does it actually mean? This, I think, is the single slide that tells it all. The three dotted lines are going from the bottom to the top are quiet rural, rural and residential noise floors. These are published in some learned report ITURP 37211 and uh, the geeks will want to know that the measurements are RMS from a vertical minor pole in 9 kilohertz bandwidth. Um, they're what I, uh, where we want to be. Um, the blue diamonds, which there are a lot of them towards the bottom of the picture, are measurements we've actually made in quiet locations. So although the theory says it should be there, you can see it really is. Um, so what are the yellow suns? Have a guess. Solar PV. So they're all measurements we've taken from solar PV. The red squares, they're all VDSL. And unfortunately, the blue triangles at the top, that's a very few installations of wind farms. But, you know, the, there is one wind farm that Tom suffers from where the signal is 60 dB above the noise threshold. In simple terms, we often think of the noise threshold as 0 dB microvolts per meter. It isn't, but it's ballpark. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Spot